Welcome to another episode of Marketing Tips for Doctors. I'm your host, Dr. Barbara Hales, and today we have with us James Bond. Uh, he is one of America's leading behavioral management specialists and author of the award-winning book, Brain Glue, that's blowing people's minds and changing how they're selling their ideas, products, and businesses. For 13 years, he ran one of Southern California's leading behavioral management firms, working with a who's who of American business. Early in his career, he ran an advertising agency in Montreal. He is a past workshop chairman for the resource partner of the U.S. Small Business Administration and has been featured guest speaker at three Southern California universities. Welcome to the show. Hi, Barbara. Thank you for having me. Your show is awesome. I absolutely am just privileged to be on this. Well, you must find it when people ask you your name, um, hard to resist to say <laughs> Bond, James Bond. So how did you get that name? I mean, obviously your parents gave it to you, but you know, like, what is the story behind that? Well, I think my parents had a sense of humor. I was born after the books and before the movies. And so because it was like only when the movie started coming out that people went like, hey, we got James Bond. Yeah, you know, it's like, okay, okay. You know, took me a while to kind of get used to it, but it's fun. I, I think, you know, I, I talk about brain glue and I think because of the power of a James, being the name James Bond, it's James I. Bond anyway, for all you out there, okay? Yeah. Uh, so it's easy to remember, but um, the brain glue and James Bond sort of relate because I would go into a room or uh, my, uh, in this area and there was like, they're putting up a new building and everything. And the guy says, hi, I'm Fred. And my wife is here, Mary here. Okay, so hi, Fred, hi, Mary. What's your name? So I said, I'm James, this is Pam. You know, and then I paused and I said, actually, my name is James Bond. I think people sort of kid me sometimes. You think you remembered my name? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> James Bond, you're James Bond. He goes like that, you know? And she starts laughing to his wife and, you know, and but you can tell they remember the name. I go into a group because I do stuff for the Small Business Administration. Sometimes I'll have like eight, nine hundred people, eight, nine hundred business owners or whatever else, and entrepreneurs and uh, marketing people. They all remember my name. They see me and because one guy says, hey, that's James Bond. That's James Bond. Really? Hey, hey, guess what? That's James Bond. And they pass it around. And suddenly, you know, I walk into a room and like everybody knows my name. I have to start remembering names. It's really hard. Well, it definitely is a great uh, uh, brand builder. That's for sure. Well, but and that and that takes me to with their products and services that have names that make them become massively successful. And I became fascinated with that. At first, I didn't understand. Maybe it was related to my because my name was that. But in time, you know, because people have asked me, like you've asked me this, and it made me think. Oh, you know, interesting. I never thought of that, but I bet it relates. But yeah, there are just certain things that stick to the brain. So if we're selling a product or an idea or a service, ideas too, because it's really uh, powerful, then there are certain tools we use that actually will make the brain go, what? Like Blue Emu. I, so I have a TV next to my computer, okay? And Blue Emu is like arthritis cream that you put on your joints and, and whatever else if you have pain, your know, shoulders and whatever else. And so there's a TV show, uh, there's a, an ad for Blue Emu uh, and it has a uh, famous baseball player. I forget what his name, Johnny Bench, who is a, a Hall of Fame baseball player. Big deal. OK, I wasn't looking at it. And then he says, Blue Emu, it works fast and you won't stink. What did he just say? And from that moment forward, I was like staring at the TV and watching in detail the commercial from that point forward. It worked fast and you won't stink, <laughs> you know, but it wakes up the brain. You know, it's almost like the, the words, you know, if you had a a business you were starting, would you call it, would you use the word dirty with the business? Well, it certainly makes people think. It's not, it would, how about dirty dancing? You know, That's wow. Dirty. How about dirty Harry movies? You know, dirty rotten scoundrels. I mean, so I have, I, I was trying to get um, um, author, uh, writers for major magazines like New York Times and stuff like that to do articles on brain glue. And it was my dirty week, okay? I was like amazed by how powerful dirty is. So I sent uh, I sent uh, 20 to 20 authors of different magazines and stuff uh, an email. And I and the title of the email was, 
the dirty truth about an article you wrote. <laughs> and then in the in the in the email, I explain what you know. I I wrote brain glue and I use dirty because it grabs your brain, with, you know, grabs your attention. Blah blah blah. These people usually don't respond right away. Many don't respond at all. I had two responded instantly. <laughs> they said, "Okay, you got me." The dirty truth about an article I wrote. Blah blah. blah. But it's just there's something about certain words, you know, like blue emu, it works fast and you won't stink. That just like grabbed your attention. You know, I mean, there's a, a woman who did a play on off Broadway and she, it was on women's rights, uh, Eve Ensler, and it's on women's rights. And she wants to what how hard it is being a woman sometimes and the things you have to go through. And so what would you call it? You know, if she called it, you know, how hard it is being a woman or something, you know, maybe people will show up, maybe they won't. Instead, she called it the vagina monologues. <laughs> People were like, what is that? <laughs> I mean, even as H, not only was she massively successful, she has an HBO series on the vagina monologues. You know, it's not what you expect, but it, it wakes up the brain. It's all, it's, in the it's, it's all in the title. All in the title. Absolutely. Absolutely. It isn't always the title, though. Sometimes it's the, uh, it's the slogan that you have also. Absolutely. You know, if you have a slogan, it's like, you know, look at the... Um, um, what's it called? Um, Johnson's baby shampoo. You know, why did it become so successful? Because no more tears, you know? So you're reading and it's in big letters on the product, Johnson's baby shampoo, no more tears. And in fact, if you take a look at the Johnson and Johnson, you know, they have products like Tylenol, Motrin, Sudafed, Bengay, Listerine, uh, Neospor and things like that. And they have names that you have to remember because it doesn't re resonate with the brain, but they're able to do that because they have more than $10 million at a time to promote, to market each one of their products. Okay. But they didn't start that way. You know, the first product they had was Johnson's baby powder, which obviously they found later on it had problems. That was 1893 Johnson's baby powder. It wasn't a fancy name. It was a simple name, but it explained what it was. Okay. Uh, later on in 1921, they combined two products, uh, adhesive uh, tape, with gauze and uh, they basically created adhesive bandages. And so what is it called? Everybody knows band-aids. <laughs> so why do they call it band-aids? Because the first word that comes to mind is bandage. And so they use something that's called um, uh, anchoring where you're taking something that's already in the brain and you're gonna use that or apply that. Okay, it's like, uh, um, well, so bandage is what people are thinking of. So they're not gonna say bandages because they can't trademark that but they'll start with band and then they're thinking what well, how do we end this band aid and they use something called alliteration or repetition of sound to band de aid you know band aid it's like i started researching this and i realized there's coca-cola best buy paypal tiktok lululemon you know i mean they use alliteration and repetition of sound because it sticks in the brain politicians use it biden's build back better you think it's a coincidence buh, buh, buh. Uh, Trump's make America great again. Good, good. You think it's a coincidence? No, they use it because psychologists know that those types of things stick to the brain. And so band aid sticks to the brain. It's easy to remember because it's bandage, band aid. Okay. So it's easy to remember. But then we have Johnson's baby shampoo that was developed in 1953. And they recognize that it, they don't want to change the name, but they want to come up with a slogan that's really powerful. And so they said, no more tears. It's for babies, no more tears. And that helped them become a blockbuster of success. I mean, there's a famous, this last thing on this, but just relating to this, Morton Salt, okay, in New York, they're over 100 years old, and they dominate the salt industry. They dominate it because of their slogan, uh, it, when it rains, it pours, has a girl with an umbrella, and the words, when it rains, it pours. Well, they were the first or one of the first salts that actually flowed easily. It didn't clog up, you know, it, it didn't uh, get clogged. And so they came up with the slogan, when it rains, it pours and sales exploded. People, oh, wow, it pours easily, right, you know? And even today, you know, Morton Salt dominates the, the salt industry with that slogan, with the girl with the umbrella and the words, when it rains, it pours. So yeah, slogans as well as names. Sorry, I'm blabbing away. <laughs> How does spraying glue differ from the traditional emotional selling techniques that we have, uh, you know, all around us? And, you know, why is it called brain glue? How did you come up with this? So it sticks to the brain like glue. There are certain things that stick to the brain like glue. So we want to, you know, there, there are two things that we want. 
when we're trying to promote, okay? The first thing is we want it to we want whatever we're promoting to stand out from the crowd. Okay? Uh where people go, "Oh, what's that?" You know, like blue emu works fast and you won't stink. What? Okay? It wakes up the brain. That's the first thing you want because we're we're so bombarded with information on. It. I mean, you're a doctor, you know. I mean, you still have to take classes and things like that. I mean, we're constantly being bombarded with marketing, knowledge, training, all that stuff. And so the brain is being overloaded. And so we have to find a way to wake up the brain so people go, huh, what's that? Then the second thing is you wanted to get um, uh, people to go, huh, let me check that out. Uh, let me give you an example, sort of a crazy example, but it's uh, metaphors, okay? <laughs> it's one of the brain glue tools. So this guy, Paul Tran, created an electric razor for man's private areas. I don't want to get too much into this, but okay. Okay. And he wanted to come up with a name that would not offend people, but would still make it obvious what it does. So he's thinking like, what is it's like? What's it's like? It's like a lawnmower. Why don't I call the product a lawnmower? He actually called his company Manscaped. So you can landscape a man with a lawnmower. Now I never bought the product. Okay. I want to start there, but if I did, I wouldn't share it. Okay. But, um, I can see calling my friend and saying, hey, Joe, just what I just bought. What? The lawnmower. Oh, you have to mow your lawn? No, it's for man's private areas. Oh, I can see him start laughing and calling his wife. Hey, Mary, guess what James just bought? What? The lawnmower. Why? You have to mow his lawn? No, to shave his private areas. And it goes on. You start, they, people start sharing it with him. I remember I was in, I think, Bed Bath & Beyond or one of these stores. And there's a poster, a white poster. And it says the lawnmower. It has an arrow and it points to the electric razor. It's like, what? So I underneath it, there's text describing what it is. I stopped with two other people who are already standing there looking at it and reading the text. Oh, that's what it is, the lawn, you know. But it's it wakes up the brain and it gets you, you know, checking it out more. And there's a woman who's online. She's a stay-at-home mom. And she created a Facebook page and she has more than 5 million fans and she spent zero on advertising. Okay. She wasn't originally selling stuff, but now she does. And so she was thinking, so um, I want to create a Facebook page. What would be a good Facebook page? Well, mom, I'm a mommy because I'm stay at home. Mom, mommy needs time to herself. Mommy needs a rest. I know what mommy needs. Mommy needs vodka. So she creates a page that says, mommy needs vodka. She has good posts, but a lot of people have good posts and they still have to fight to try to get people coming. But she has, mommy needs vodka. I remember I have a friend that must be one of her fans. And so I got a post, uh, one of her posts and I'm looking at it. So oh, yeah, it's really hot and it's pretty funny. It's from mommy needs vodka, what? And I clicked on that, it took me to her page. And then I saw some of the other posts she had. I said, oh yeah, she's fun. I'm gonna be a fan. I became one of the 5 million and plus fans. But it, what did it do? It woke up the brain and then it got me taking action somehow. And that's what we want to do. I mean, I mean, with any product you're selling, isn't that what we want to do or any service that we're selling is we want people to wake up. So they go, oh, let me check this out and then, you know, move forward and uh, and, uh, you know, get involved with it somehow. Why are there certain memories more likely to stick than others? Well, so let me give you one of the examples that's really powerful. I, okay, rhyme, okay? Um, I remember this. We probably all remember this. Jack and Jill went up the hill, right? I mean, I think we all remember this because rhyme is rhyme sticks to the brain. I mean, you, you know, people use it like uh, um, uh, the cat in the hat and stuff like that, you know? I mean, famous things when we were kids, but without many of us don't realize that the reason they use it also and the reason it sticks is because of rhyme. I could be on my deathbed. I mean, the last time I heard Jack and Joe went up the hill was like 60 years ago. I could be on my deathbed and somebody says, hey, James, Jack and Joe went up there. And I go, hill to fetch a pail of water. I mean, it sticks to the brain. I'd remember it. Okay. So um, uh, when OJ Simpson's trial was going on right near the end of the trial, uh, Johnny Cochran, his attorney, one of his Johnny Cochran's friends gave him this phrase and said, when if the glove doesn't fit, you have to acquit. And now, OJ put on a rubber glove first. There's a glove that they believe was from the actual murder. And then he, you know, he showed that it was hard to put on. OK, whether he was acting or not. Um, and so Johnny Cochran said, well, you know, if the glove doesn't fit, you have to acquit. 
It was right near the end of the trial, okay? To, so the jurors would remember it. I remember two of the, watching an interview with um, a, 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 a journalist asking two of the jurors, and one of the jurors nodded her head in agreement while the other one explained. And the journalist said, with all that evidence against OJ, why do you find him not guilty? And she said, we knew if the glove doesn't, if the glove don't fit, you have to acquit. The glove didn't fit. We had to acquit, you know, you rhyme. Go. So rhyme. Besides, besides rhyming, what other techniques uh, are good uh, <clears throat> to create persuasive messages? Um, well, so one of the most powerful ones, they're all powerful. And often they're powerful because you can use two of them, okay? But one of the most powerful ones is, is um, um, what do we call it again? Uh, hang on a second. Analogies or metaphors. Mm -hmm. And so um, when I came to Southern California from Canada, I um, met John Gray. And John Gray was telling me about a book he wrote that was incredible. And it was called Men, Women, and Relationships. And he was frustrated. He was telling me that, you know, I he, he was frustrated because he wrote this book and, and people who read the book, Men, Women, and Relationships, found it to be the most profound book or one of the most profound books they've ever read. It helped them strengthen their relationship, et cetera. But almost nobody was buying the book, even though it was like fantastic. And so he was in a, a seminar trying to promote the book and he said something and all the women started laughing and the men looked at the women and went like, what are you laughing at? What did he say? It was so funny. And he said, see, there are some things that women think are really funny and men don't. There are some things that men think are really funny and women don't. And there are some things that everybody thinks are funny. So one of the women hollered out, yeah, it's almost like men are from a different planet. What planet do you think men are from? And he goes, I guess men are from Mars. And everybody started laughing. When he got home, he was thinking, huh, if men are from Mars, where are women from? Well, women are from Venus because Venus is the god of love. What happens if I change the title of the book? The men are from Mars, women are from Venus, and then do some references throughout the book to it, but basically keep the same book. What do you think happened? Almost well, overnight. That's history. And the rest, he sold 50 million copies. Of, he went from 20,000 to 50 million copies of the book because of the title, Metaphor. That's okay. That's, yeah. And it, but you'd think, you know, like men are from Mars, women are from Venus, that's not telling you what it is. It kind of is. You know, the brain has to rethink this and go like, Men are from Mars, women from Venus. I remember being in a bookstore and I'm going, book, book, book. Men are from Mars, women from Venus, book, book. Men are from Mars, women from Venus? What's that? Picked it up, looked at it, which is if you want someone to buy it, there's a good chance that they pick it up. Started looking at it. Oh, this is really great. Okay, so metaphors are really powerful. I work with, well, John, um, Jack Canfield wrote Chicken Soup for the Soul. He sold also uh, 60 other bestsellers, but Chicken Soup for the Soul sold 500 million copies. OK, and it's a metaphor. So, uh, you know, because it, it, when you open it up, you buy the book, Chicken Soup for a Soul, you don't open it up and get chicken soup. Oh, look, there's chicken soup in the book. No, you know, it's like men are from Mars, women from Venus. I know a lot of women, you women out there think we are from a different planet. We I, we might be actually, but we're not really from Mars. Uh, but it just metaphors are really powerful. So if you start with your products or service or idea, whatever you're trying to promote, Complete the phrase, my product or idea is just like, and be as crazy as possible, like the lawnmower guy, okay? You know, be as crazy as possible because it gets you brainstorming. You may not use the craziest idea, but what you do is it will get you thinking and then you'll start coming up with other metaphors that will really help you. I had, I work with uh, Jack Canfield, I mean, uh, Warren Buffett's team. Warren Buffett, brought, they brought me in because of my behavioral management background. And uh, he has a, a good phrase that he, he would say that uses a trigger word, okay? And he says, um, only when the tide goes out do you discover who's been swimming naked. <laughs> what did he just say? Good one. <laughs> no, what he's basically saying is only when times get tough do you realize who's competent or capable. But if he said that, you go, oh, yeah, because it's logical. But emotional, only when the tide goes out do you discover who's been swimming naked. I mean, like. I can see that. So when I heard that, I said, hey, maybe I should have that to describe brain glue. You know, brain glue is, it grabs attention just like a naked man running through your backyard. You see a naked man running through your backyard, you're going to go, what? Okay. And that's what brain glue does. It makes them go, what? And then they check it out, you know, but so when you start to understand uh, these tools and I, metaphor is a very good one to start with. 
um, then that becomes really a powerful way to do it. Well, now that we are uh, thick into political discussions and wondering who our next president is going to be, how did U.S. presidents, civil rights activists, and comedians use brain glued type tools to help build their fame and boost their image, their messages? Well, they use a lot. Okay, <laughs> they understand a lot, and they use lots of psychologists who understand the power of this. Uh, so let me give you some. Uh, so first. Um, President John F. Kennedy used something called chiasmus, and chiasmus is a flip, you know, all for one and one for all, okay? When the going gets tough, the tough get going, okay? He said, um, um, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. He also said, um, uh, well, uh, and Malcolm X said, uh, who was a civil rights activist, a black civil rights activist, he wanted to say, you have no idea how hard it is being a, a black person in America back then, you know, today too for many, but, you know, back then. So what he said was, we didn't land on Plymouth Rock, the rock landed on us. And it's like, oh, interesting. And it's, it resonates much more than if you said, do you have an idea how hard it is being a black person? That's not that it doesn't resonate, like sticking to the brain, like, you know, we didn't land on Plymouth Rock, the rock landed on us. He also has a famous phrase that a lot of other people use. They don't realize he's the one that started it and said, when you stand for nothing, you'll fall for anything. These are powerful phrases. That is powerful. There's a famous, pardon? That is powerful. Yeah. Oh yeah, it's just, it really, it resonates. You know, it stays with you and it's something you can share with other people. It sticks to the brain. So they recognize uh, rhyme. So uh, back in the days of um, LBJ, Lyndon Johnson, people hated the Vietnam War. Okay, and you know, for good reason, it was just a whole, I don't want to get into that. But uh, so they had a phrase that they would use. Hey, hey, LBJ, how many kids have you killed today? Whoa, what? And that, you know, those things stick and they stick to the brain of the person you're talking to often also. And so because of that, it becomes really, um, you know, powerful ways to use tools like these to uh, give a hoot, don't pollute is a good example, you know, for anti-pollution. Um, you know, it's funny because LBJ's slogan was all the way with LBJ. And then the anti, uh, uh, Vietnam people were saying, uh, Hey, Hey, LBJ, how many kids did you kill today? You know, they recognize we can use, he's using rhyme. We're going to use rhyme, you know, cause rhyme sticks <laughs> that became really hard, but yeah, it just, you know, it just, it, it just, uh, it's amazing how, when we start to recognize these tools that stick to the brain, it really helps us a lot to understand how to say something. And let me give you an example of this, okay? Because it's really important that we understand if we start logical, okay? They're emotional people and they're very good at this, okay? Brain glue. But most people are logical. And so this is for logical people. We start with something logical, a logical description, and then we apply emotional tools so that it triggers the brain. Um, I went to a Zig Ziglar uh, workshop when I was younger, he, a live workshop, I actually met him. And he had a great line. He said, because I hated selling back then. Today, I love it. I teach it and all that stuff. But I, I hated it. It was terrible. And he said, selling is nothing more than a transference of passion. You know, you have to be passionate about something. Well, we get passionate. We create a product, let's say, and we get really passionate about it. But then we try to be logical on how we explain here are the features, here are the benefits, blah, 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 blah. Is, but if you saw a movie that you loved that was really great, I saw the movie Hidden Figures about the three black women who worked at NASA. I love that movie, one of my favorite movies. You don't have to tell me how to sell it because I have passion. I'll share that passion with you. Well, when we have a product or a service that we're trying to promote, hopefully we have passion for it also. Start, you know, you could start with logic, but you want to communicate from a passion standpoint. So let me give you an example. There's a mom and son in Utah, and they love shark tank and so they're watching shark tank and then the mom says to the son wouldn't it be great if we invent a product and uh, then we could uh, get on shark tank and get rich and have fun with it and so they're thinking okay fine it took about a month to come up with this okay and then uh during that month a doc she has constipation so the mom so the, the doctor says to the mom you know if you raise your feet when you're on the toilet from six to eight inches off the toilet it changes the shape of your body and it really helps you a lot when you're going to the bathroom. She tried it and it worked. And then she thought, wow, this would be a great product for us to sell. Make a little bench 
that we could put wrap around the toilet and then we could slide it out and put your feet on it, you know, when we do this. So, okay, great. And they found a manufacturer, you know, I don't know, three bucks each or something. They bought a thousand for three thousand dollars, whatever it was. And then they said, well, we need to come up with a name for it. We always start with logical, okay? So it's toilet stool, but that's not really a nice name, toilet stool. Who's going to buy that? She's thinking about it. She says, well, what's another word for toilet? Potty. And you're kind of squatting when you're sitting on it. Squatty potty. Why don't we call it the squatty potty, which is use alliteration and repetition of sound. And it's almost rhyme, squatty potty. Squatty potty sales, these are two people that had almost no, that virtually no business ex experience. In a couple of years, they reached a hundred million dollars of sales. They made it on Shark Tank and everything else. So, so I, I was in a hospital recently, a couple of months ago for heart bypass surgery. And one of the nurses was talking to me and saying, hey, well, what do you do? I said, hey, I wrote a book called Brain Glue. And I started telling this story about the squatty potty. And she says, I got to tell you this. I'm a nurse. I know about the idea of raising your feet off the, the floor. I actually have a little bench, a little thing I do that, that I use off the floor. But I saw Squatty Potty and I loved the name so much, I ended up buying the product. Even though I had one, I figured this is cool. I got to own one of these. Just because she liked the name, she bought the product, even though she had one. I mean, she had a basic way to do this. And that, that's what happens is because it triggers the brain in such a way that it makes us go, hmm. Oh, interesting. Oh, okay. That's why what I always say is always start with a logical description of what your product is, toilet stool, and then work with, you know, uh, what are other words for that that you can use? And then, you know, rhyme could help and other ways, things like that. Alliteration, you know, with the repetition of sound. But yeah, always start with logic and then start having fun. How did these tool tools help Marilyn Monroe become famous? <laughs> okay, so uh marilyn monroe's name was mary jean mortensen okay and that was her name and so um uh her her manager she was a model at the beginning and her manager said norma jean mortensen excuse me and uh her her manager said that's not a good name norma jean you know marilyn's a good name why don't you change your name to marilyn and she goes okay marilyn I, okay i can do that and then she's thinking, this is, she knew a brain glue tool. A lot of us know it without realizing it. Alliteration, repetition of sound. Her mother's maiden name was Monroe, uh, M Marilyn Monroe. So she said, maybe I should change my name to Marilyn Monroe. So she instinctively knew, you know, alliteration works. And so she changed her name to Marilyn Monroe. It was her mother's maiden name. Okay, that's the first thing. The second one is she loved Jean Harlow. Jean Harlow was a famous actress at the time. And Jean Harlow had platinum blonde hair. And so she lived in Southern California and found the hairdresser that dyed Jean Harlow's hair and said, could you dye my hair the same color, platinum blonde? They said, yes. So now she's Marilyn Monroe with platinum blonde hair. Okay. <laughs> so then she's looking at photographs of Jean Harlow and she realizes in some of the photographs, Jean Harlow has a beauty mark on the left side of her cheek. And in some of the beauty mark, in some of the photographs, the beauty marks on her chin. And she goes, wait a second. I bet she doesn't even have a beauty mark. I bet she's just putting a dot on her face to attract attention to herself. So Marilyn, she would always use makeup to hide the beauty mark. Instead of using makeup to hide the beauty mark, now she'd use it to darken the beauty mark and became massively successful. That's not the only reason. And that's one of the reasons. She believed it was the main reason. So uh, Cindy Crawford is a famous uh, model, a supermodel. She's the first supermodel, okay? She became, and she still is famous. And Cindy Crawford, in her bio, biography, in her book, she says that when she was young, she has this beauty mark, this birthmark above her lip, her left side of her lip. And she begged her mom, please take me to the doctor and have it removed. And she says, now, I am so glad my mom didn't get it removed because I believe that beauty mark is the reason I became a supermodel. OK, so it's because it's there's something called alliteration uh, it's, I've called redintegration, the brain's need for completion. OK. We, that's why rhyme works, because if you start a rhyme, people like the end of the rhyme, okay? They like symmetry, but that means asymmetry. There's a famous actor, I forget his name, but he's got like a, 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 a lazy eye. One of his eyes is lazy. He's really famous. And I've, when I say it and I show pictures, people, oh yeah, we know him. He's really famous, but he's got a lazy eye and it stands out because of that. So there's a famous uh, advertiser named David Ogilvy in the early days of the advertising industry. And he worked with uh, Hathaway Shirts. 
like Marilyn Monroe, using the same idea, okay? Um, and so what he's doing is, he's he was, uh, um, Hathaway Shirts is owned by Warren Buffett, so he, that's why his, his company is called Berkshire Hathaway, okay? But it, David Ogilvy was working at the beginning of Hathaway Shirts, and he was the first advertiser to advertise it. So if you're doing an ad for a shirt in the magazine, what do you have? You have a good looking guy wearing a nice shirt, nice pair of pants, maybe in a nice background, whatever, okay? Just like every other shirt ad. So he decided to use asymmetry, uh, uh, redintegration, but asymmetry, the opposite of symmetry. And he put an eye patch on the guy for no reason. It's just like, uh, just like Marilyn Monroe had the dot on her face, okay? He put an eye patch on the guy and he calls it in headlines, the man in the Hathaway shirt. Never explains why the guy has an eye patch, by the way. And they have like tons of ads with all these different guys, but they all have an eye patch. So you're flipping through a magazine and you go, oh, there's a guy with an eye patch. What's that? The man in the Hathaway shirt. Oh. And it helped Matt Hathaway shirts become a blockbuster of success with this crazy, you know, asymmetrical tool, just like Marilyn Monroe with her dot on her face, you know? So, yeah. You know, a lot of top marketers rave about the book that you put out and said, quote, one of the most important marketing books you will ever read, unquote. Uh, what what makes uh, what makes that so for your book? Well, it helps. So the first thing you do is you take a product or service that you have, and some people don't want to change the title, but let's say you're willing to change the name of it. Of it. Then I, it feels logical. I mean, it feels natural because first you do, like with a uh, uh, toilet stool and squatty potty, the first thing you do is come up with a logical way to describe what it is you have. So people feel comfortable with that. And then you go through an exercise where you try these different tools because you say, I, you recognize I want an um, emotional trigger. Okay. And so squatty, but who would think of, uh, you know, you come up with a toilet stool, who would think of squatty potty? You know, out of the blue, would you think of that? No, but if you go through an exercise, it makes it easy to come up with that. You go, oh, wow. Well. You know, potty. What are other words for toilet? Uh, potty. Okay, I'm potty. What rhymes with potty? You know, and then you start playing with that. And then uh, other, you, you can write down the tools. Well, you're kind of sitting, you're squatting, you're, you know, what are some of the things? When you put that together and you come up with the name, it sticks forever. And that's what's really fun. <clears throat> um but yeah, it's, but it doesn't have to be a name. So a lot of people have a product and or service already and they have the name for it. They don't want to change the name. So this way, it lets you come up with a slogan for it, a way to describe it. And I'll go back to Johnson & Johnson that said, uh, you know, uh, with, the baby with the baby shampoo and uh, it's, uh, um, you know, you won't, uh, what is it again? <laughs> um, uh, no more tears, you know? I mean, if they didn't, if they just said Johnson's baby shampoo, maybe they would have been successful. Maybe them if they were the first product out there, but it, because it said no more tears, you know, suddenly people can relate to it. Yo, know, I definitely want to get this for my little girl because it's no more tears. I don't want you know her tearing up when I wash her hair, you know. And so it, that people start doing this and they start applying it to their product, service, or business, and they start having massive success and they love it. But they also love it because Selling is nothing more than a transference of passion. And when we're logical, it almost shuts down the passion that we have. I want to tell you why I should get this product because, or you should get this product because of this and because of this, because of this, because of this. And you, you could see it in their face. They're not, they're not emotional. They're trying to be very logical and serious. But when they describe the product, you got to get squatty potty. Whoa, it's, you know, you can see that emotionally it affects us and people are affected by emotion. I saw this person, this guy who had a t-shirt and it said, life sucks and then you die. And I'm like, no, this is life right now. We have an opportunity to have some fun, you know, and to have emotional inter inter interaction. That's why we love movies and music songs and things like that. I mean, we love them because they affect us emotionally. Well, we want people that are going to affect us emotionally and products also. You have a background in behavioral management. What is that exactly? Uh, getting people to change what they do. Uh, so uh, there's habits. So we have that. We are creatures of habit. So we do things a certain way. That's why it's hard to get. So cigarette smokers is a good example. I don't work with cigarette smokers, but we could do that also. Cigarette smokers have two things, a few things that they benefit why they use cigarettes. First is because it's uh, addictive. So we got that. Okay. It's phys physically addictive. But the second thing is it makes them feel calm. 
you know, they kind of get used to the fact whenever they get stressed, they pull out a cigarette. Oh, yeah, I feel calm. It also gets your hand working with your mouth. So you're physically getting involved with this thing. Also, people love, you know, how I got to light it. And, hey, I got a cool lighter or whatever else it is. So you go through that whole process. So if you're trying to change the behavior of that person, it's complicated because you have many layers that you're dealing with, not just physiological, uh, but emotional. So I will deal with things like, so one of the first, uh, I, I work with lots of different companies for lots of different reasons, but often it's getting them to tackle something that's out of their comfort zone. You know, we have goals. We set goals for ourselves and that's fine. Okay. But if you want to tackle something out of your comfort zone, it's hard, you know, it's scary. We don't realize it, you know, but for many of the things that we want to tackle, we'll write it down as a goal and say, I want to accomplish this as a goal. But then when we start working on it, we go get this hard thing and we go like, oh, this is so hard. Okay. Um, let me go back and make a list again. You know, we'll go back to making, doing stuff and we'll get stuck in doing stuff that isn't going to move us forward towards the goal instead of just crossing the bridge and tackling that thing. And so with behavioral management, we would, uh, I'll give you an example with, uh, okay with a major uh, biotech company. I don't want to say what the company is, but we've worked with several. So, um, but we came in, we started working with uh, the number three person, one of the major companies. When he realized how powerful this process was, because it would help them tackle stuff bigger than they were comfortable doing. He came back and said, okay, I, I want to change my goal. And we would say, you know, within a few months, you can only change it once. You can't change it over and over again because you'll never get anything done, okay? But if you want, once you understand how powerful this is, you can change it once. And so he said, okay, I want to get rid of the CEO and founder of the company. <laughs> I'm like, oh, I have a good poker face. But I'm like, what? <laughs> you know, and he said, are you serious? That's what you want to do? Yes, absolutely. I want to sit down with the board of directors. You know, we've reached like a couple of billion dollars now and this person is incompetent and we need to get rid of them. Uh, okay, you know, and I, I would work on it, you know, but because we're getting him tackling something that's a little bigger than he's used to tackling. One of the, the one of the things I found, which is very common with senior managers, probably common with everybody, but more with senior managers at organizations, is saying I don't know or I don't know how. People hate saying that. If I say I don't know often enough, I mean, you're a doctor. If you say, well, can you help me with this? Well, no, I don't know how to do that. Okay, can you help me with this? I don't know how to do that. You start thinking in your mind, see, if I say that too often, they're going to wonder why I'm a doctor, you know? You know, managers are the same. You know, they're afraid to say, I don't know, or I don't know how. So what they do is they pretend, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, sure. With you. And they come up with all, you know, uh, alternate way of saying it without saying, ever saying, I don't know, or I don't know how. And so we had a trucking company and uh, they had the two partners, the two uh, brothers, and they had like 50 long, you know, tractor trailers, big trucks. Oops. Uh, sorry. So they had uh, big trucks. And so uh, the, they hired us because they wanted to improve the productivity of uh, their company. But once one of the brothers who owns the company realized how powerful this was, he said, okay, I know what I want to do. Can I change my task? I said, sure. What do you want to change it to? He said, I want to start buying competitors. I've never done it before. We're terrified of doing it. We can't even imagine how to do this. But with you guys pushing us, we would love to start buying a competitor. We have a competitor. He's an old guy. His kids don't want to take over the trucking company. They just want money from dad, but they don't want to take over the business. And so he would be ideal to buy the company from. Okay, great. So that's what we focused on. So he, they have an in-house CPA accountant. And uh, so his goal, now that we had everybody focusing on the, acquiring other companies, his goal was to go and evaluate the, this guy's company so that they could figure out how much to pay and everything else. So he came back because we do it multiple weeks. That's how habit works. Okay. It's never happens like just once you got to work on it uh, week after week. So he, the first week he came back and uh, wasn't able to do it. He said, no, I was just too busy. I wasn't able to do it. We actually do business and personal goals. So we can, there are a lot of psychological reasons why we do this. When you mix work and play the brain diverse to play. So we do that. The second week he came back and he didn't do it also. And we make them beg after two weeks that, because they're not allowed to do it again and unless they beg, please let me do one more time. He finally explained, he said, there, you guys are having me go over and do an analysis of this company. I have never analyzed a business for acquisition before. I am terrified that I will screw up and cause you, us to go bankrupt because I did. But he was terrified to say that to everybody. But I'm saying we're getting you to tackle something bigger in your comfort zone. 
So once he admitted that, then as a group, we worked it out and said, well, do you know attorneys? Well, we know a bunch of attorneys. Well, they probably know lots of CPAs. They probably know a CPA. Let's ask our attorneys if they know an accountant who's actually done acquisitions. They did. We found one. And he ended up, she ended up mentoring this guy. But he was afraid to say, I don't know, or I don't know how. So he pretended, oh, I'll do it this week. Sure. Okay. I'll do it this week, even though he didn't. And that's one of the tools that we use to get people to tackle something outside their comfort zone. That's why behavioral management, I'm just fascinated. I started with advertising. I was a photographer and then I learned advertising to like, because advertising controls, uh, you know, photographs. And then I learned, uh, and I, in school, I love psychology. Okay. Uh, and, and, but it was like, you know, go into engineering, but I love psychology. Okay. And so, and as I went forward, I learned that marketing controls advertising, you know, because marketing is how do you get from here to here? What's the, what's the ultimate objective that you want to accomplish? Well, uh, behavioral management controls all that stuff because it's like, how do you change a behavior? How do you get somebody who hates something to like something? How do you get somebody to try a product that they may not have tried? You know, and it works. And I'll give you an example of, because I, I love this example of anchoring, okay? Anchoring is one of the tools uh, like a, like um, um, uh, we do head and shoulders, knees and toes, eyes, ears, mouth and nose. Most of us know that for as we we're kids. So if you're coming up with a dandruff shampoo, why don't you call it head and shoulders, right? <clears throat> so uh, Ronald Reagan, this is not pro or con any of the political parties, but Ronald Reagan became, came, came into power after the Vietnam War. So people would protest uh, anything that had to do with war. And so they said, we need missile defense system. We have this, uh, you know, we can create this missile defense system. They could shoot down missiles from space uh, if it's firing against America. And But he realized if I said to everybody, we want to launch a missile defense system, then they start getting tons of protests. We don't want anything that has to do with war and everything else. <clears throat> but back then, the movie Star Wars was really successful. It just started. So they came up with the idea, why don't we call it the Star Wars Missile Defense System? Why don't we marry these two things together? So he said, so we want to launch this thing called the Star Wars Missile Defense System. And then instead of having protesters, people went, oh, how cool, how cool. And suddenly, instead of having people protesting, they were actually saying, that's really cool. Guess what? We're getting the Star Wars Missile Defense System because he anchored the two things together. Or they anchored whoever it was, the two things together. But so when you start to understand these tools, you start to understand maybe there's something that people don't like or wouldn't consider as a product or a service. Like this woman for Squatty Potty. She didn't need a Squatty Potty. She already had this thing. She's a nurse, but she knows it. And yet she still bought it because the name was so cool. Yeah, I get a Squatty Potty. How cool is that? And that's why what we want to do when we're selling something or promoting something, whether it's an idea like, uh, you know, we didn't land up Plymouth Rock, the rock landed on us or things like that. Or, you know, we, when you stand for nothing, you'll fall for anything, you know. You get to say things or sell things that become much people become much more receptive with. And that's basically what Bringo is all about, is how to pay, make people more receptive. I mean, we start with product or service because most people are in business and they want to do that. But it goes beyond that. It's, you know, it's just uh, really powerful um, on so many levels. You know, there, <clears throat> there are so many uh, marketing and persuasion books out there, and there are so many marketing professionals that that are out there how do you differ from all of them so let me say this first is that people like jack canfield who did chicken soup for the soul fell in love with the book these people fall recognize there's nothing like this that's one of the things that's really powerful you know there's nothing like this i defy you to show me a book that has that relates to this it has 14 tools takes you through it and you start to understand whoa this is really powerful okay uh, like i had a friend who has, he's kind of closed minded on certain things. And I'm trying to tell him to have an open mind. And so if I said, you know, Joseph, can you have an open mind? You're so closed minded. He'd get pissed off at me. Shut up. You know, what are you telling me? To, all that stuff. Okay. But so I figured, let me try a brain glue tool. Okay. So um, I wanted to have an open mind. So the word open. Okay. So what are other things that work when they're open? An umbrella works when it's open. A parachute works when it's open. A book. You know, if you buy a book, but don't open it, you're not going to benefit from it. You got to open the book and check it out. OK, so I was thinking, let me pick parachute. So I said, Joseph, you know, your mind is like a parachute. It works better when it's open. And he pauses and he goes, eh, OK, well, what do you mean? You know, I kind of that's interesting. OK, 
And he was like more open-minded than if I would have said, hey, come on, have an open mind, okay? And so when we start to, you know, there's there's nothing that has these tools that are, there's that's why people find us so amazing. So let me use John. So let me talk about my mistake, okay? So um, first there's a guy, uh, Carrie Smith, and Carrie Smith had a company, if you remember the name of the company. Um, um, I forget the name of the company, but it was a fan company, okay? Um, it was uh, large, I, whatever it was. It was just, he had this logical description of what the company was, okay? And so his, um, uh, he, he comes up, a guy says, well, you have like, these are fans that, that, you know, you work in farms and barns and all that stuff. You know, if you have a barn, you're not going to put air conditioning in the barn for horses and cows. You put a big fan in it. So he, the, he was trying to explain how the fan works and what it's like. And so the guy said, well, what's it like? He said, well, it's big ass fans. And the guy goes, big ass fans. Oh, OK. I definitely want one of those. And he went like, oh, interesting. I used the term big ass fans and they were much more responsive than what the previous name I came up with. Oh, interesting. So he ran an ad for big ass fans and sales exploded. So he said, wait, maybe I should change the name of the company to big ass fans. He did, and the rest of the day is history. He sold it for half a billion dollars, his company, okay? After 15 years in business. A lot of people are lucky to sell it for anything. Okay, he made a fortune. So that was the, my big ass fans week, okay? So when I first launched the book, I thought maybe I should use the word ass, okay? So why don't I call the book um, Dump Your Half-Ass Marketing Strategy? So I created that, that was the title. And then uh, Amazon uh, for books, I had like 80 responses of people saying they love the book. And uh, but Am and if you get over 100 responses on Amazon, they promote it. They help promote the book. And so I'm close to that. And so Amazon says, no, you're not allowed to advertise on Amazon because you have a swear word in it. I said, oh, come on. Said, no, you can't. So I begged them. I said, if I change the title, would you let me uh, do this and keep the same move all the uh, testimonials? They said, OK, fine. We are not allowed to do this, but we will let you do that. So me like a putz. I came up with a logical title. I'm selling everybody on emotional selling. I came up with a logical title. And the title was Sell More with the Right Brain Marketing Strategy. Anyway, so we transferred the title. So then when I met John Gray, John Gray, I mean, uh, uh, Jack Hanfield, who wrote Chicken Soup for the Soul, um, he got pissed off at me, okay? I had a friend that sort of put my book as in a pile of books that he was looking at. He said, I was so pissed off. I started looking at your book. I couldn't put the damn thing down, <laughs> okay? I'm like... I'm sorry. Can I use that as a quote? You know, and he says on one condition. I said, a condition? What's the condition? He said, I'll give you tons of testimonials. On it. I love this book. I'm giving it to everybody in my company is required to read your book and use it and everything else. But you got to change the title. You got a left brain title and you said, right, you're teaching us how to sell emotionally. The whole book is about brain glue. You got to change the title from sell more to right brain marketing strategy that nobody can remember to brain glue. I'm like, do I have to? He said, yes. And I'll give you all the titles, all the help you want. And I, I love this book. This is a, everybody I know needs to read this. And, but it made me realize also, I'm like most people, that I came up with a logical title for an emotional book. What can I say? You know, but it just, but he was right. You know, I was, I had to start from zero. So there are actually both books are out there. You can go on Amazon and get either one. But uh, people couldn't, people actually, because my name is James Bond. They couldn't, they would promote my book to friends and nobody could find my book for two reasons. One is because James Bonds, you're going to get all the other James Bonds. You can't even find me. James I. Bond works though, by the way, everybody. But the other one was, you know, someone with the right brain marketing strategy. They couldn't remember the title. It was like, I can't even remember the title. You know, and the book is about brain glue anyway. Why do you even have that stupid title? But it just, it's, it's, we fall into this category. And that's why, uh, you know, it, it is unique. I defy somebody to show me another book that's like this. You know, I mean, people, that's why people have been telling me and experts have been telling me that, no, it's unique. We don't know why nobody talks about this. Maybe because of my background too, how I invented, how I developed this. I learned this and there's a whole process that I go through about how I learned this, but I became fascinated as you're fascinated, you know, Barbara, you're fascinated by medical things. And when you learn something new, it becomes really valuable for you. And for me, brain glue is like, it's amazing. And I just, every day, practically, or certainly every week, I learn new things that relate to it. And it's like, oh, and that's things that I could share with people. Does that make sense? James, at this point, we'd like to ask if you could kindly give two tips to physicians out there 
to market themselves? You know, what are two tips that they could implement right away to make themselves more successful and have an easier life? So the first thing is start with a metaphor. Okay. Come, my I am or my product or service is just like blank. Okay. And be as crazy as possible. Uh, what's that knife that you open up the, the, um, um, Swiss blade, uh, the knife that has all the different types of things on it. The Swiss blade, a Swiss, Swiss army knife. Right. So you said, I'm working with me is like working with having a Swiss army knife. You could even say it as a, as a doctor because I can check all these different areas. Okay. So have fun with it, but come up with a metaphor. My service products service, whatever it is, is just like, and have fun. Be as crazy as possible. Even ask friends, okay? But so that's how you, that's a first place to start. Second is make a shopping list of all the words that relate to your product or service, okay? And then do two things. Start with words that rhyme with it, okay? I would say switch. So pitch. I help you with your pitch, okay? So what are words that rhymes with pitch? Switch your pitch if you want to get rich. Oh, there you go. Switch your pitch if you want to get rich, okay? As time went on, I said. I want to be a little more sophisticated. So I said, I help people, um, um, you know, become de desire, build desire. What rhymes with desire? Buyer, uh, light the fire of desire in your buyer. Oh, I show you how to light the fire of desire in your buyer. Doesn't that resonate more? It does. For all of us, come up, list the words that relate to your product service idea, and then start looking for rhyme words. That rhyme is the easiest way. And then when you do that, you'll start putting things together that are really fun. Uh, and then alliteration, words that have the same sound, like Coca-Cola, Best Buy, buh, 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 whatever else it is, Band-Aid, you know, that where you're repeating a sound. And those three alone can be just tremendously powerful. I'll, you know, the book has more. It has 14, okay? So it shows you some really powerful tools. And when you can mix them together, it's fine. But you can come with, up with, you know, just a metaphor, my product or service or idea is just like blank and then rhyme and then so, it's something that rhymes with it. You know, Timex, it takes a licking and keeps on ticking, you know? Oh, okay. <laughs> Interesting. But it, it sticks to the brain. It, we tend to remember it and it stand out. And it's, there's a scientific reason why, but it's when you trigger different parts of the brain at the same time, the brain tends to remember things more, but it keeps them stuck together. So every time you say, chicken soup for the soul people go you know they don't realize you know they know you're not going to open up and get chicken soup they know what it's all hey, it's chicken soup i'd love to cut a book open put some chicken soup in it really surprise someone but anyway that'll be another thing <laughs> well i can honestly say i'm going to run out and get your book because i want to hear all of the tools that we haven't had time to discuss today thank you so much for being on our show oh barbara thank you so much for having me your your show is awesome and it's a privilege to be here uh, you've been listening to Marketing Tips for Doctors with your host, Dr. Barbara Hales, and a very interesting character here who talks about brain glue by the name of Bond, James Bond. Uh, so we'll hear you on the next, uh, we'll you know, see you guys on the next episode. Till then.